Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Roy Evans of the Jericho Broadcast Networks, and I am here with Mr. Darren Reed, who is the Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development. Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Roy. Glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks. So let's start off by telling the folks a little bit about what Stride Professional Development is. Yeah, absolutely. Stride uh, is a is the nation's leading uh provider of online education in the K through 12 space. We were formerly known as K-12 Inc. and uh, are, you know, over two decades in the space of providing um, free virtual online education across the nation to students, no matter where they are. Um, we've since exchanged our name to Stride uh, because we're, we, we've done expanded beyond the K-12 space, though, though that's still very much what we do as a priority. Um, what we've also done with the Stride Professional Development Center is we've leveraged some of our expertise over the past two plus decades of supporting schools and students and educators, teachers, principals. Um, and we are trying to innovate, you know, the way professional development happens for educators. And that we're doing that through the Stride Professional Development Center. Um, gone are the days where, you know, it's face-to-face -face only PD. Um, it's episodic professional development. Um, it's professional development that's not necessarily relevant to what teachers and educators need right away. So the Professional Development Center is designed to solve that challenge with some unique and uh, innovative uh, ways of delivering content. All right, man. Well, listen, we are super excited here at the network to be engaged with you all in helping to provide this opportunity for teachers all across the country, and especially those teachers that are coming from our HBCU backgrounds, because we Absolutely. know that education was always one of the stalwarts of most HBCUs in this country. They all had teaching programs, and that's what a lot of them were founded for. So, Darren, let's talk absolutely. a little bit about those special programs that you guys have for yeah. the teacher. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Roy, you hit, you hit on the very important point. Um, you know, right now in our country, we're facing, facing probably one of the greatest challenges, you know, of our teaching core that we have in many, many years, and that, that's around this teacher shortage. You know, a lot of teachers are exiting the profession, Um um, just just based on tenure, you know, they're they're retiring and moving on, and then you have, you know, our existing teachers who are who are being taxed and stressed, you know, particularly post COVID, with, you know, increasing demands, um, challenges that they're facing in the classroom, and a host of other other uh, issues that, that they struggle with, and um, we need good teachers, and we need to support the teachers that we have. So the two things that we're doing. Um, is that we know first-year teachers, among all teachers, are among the first to leave the profession uh, within the first five years. I think they do um, at, at a 44% rate, which is just scary to think that folks are, you know, graduated, want to go in a classroom and make a difference, but, you know, feel like they need to leave within the first five years because it's so challenging. So we want to support them. Um, obviously, as a new teacher, your school that you 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 work where you work your first year, the district where you work, there will be some professional development support to assist you. But we want to go a step further. We want to help every teacher in the country get off to a strong start uh, to their first year and have some uh, stick to itiveness, you know, to help them get through that first year. So we're offering a year free um, access to the strike. <laughs> I love my HBCU And boy, boy I love it, love it yeah, I love it, love it yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU And man yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. man. I hope my team they won one yeah. I hope my team they won one yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab To see if my team won a loss If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth But if they won, keep tab uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talkin they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike Washington disappeared just that fast. He's back <laughs> on the side. I tried to reel him in, but you can't keep a good man down. Can't tie him down as he is busy as a... Uh, with that being said, welcome to episode 482 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. 
Well, Charles and I will hold it down. We have a great guest coming in here. Give some updates on CIAA SIEC as they start running towards tournament time. Yeah. Awesome past the halfway mark. Got some great races going on. Got some top dogs, both on the men's and women's side. And then uh, we might sneak in and talk a little bit about the big game tonight uh, up for the OVC with Tennessee State and Moorhead State in terms of the men's side. And then you got an old rivalry, HBCU-wise. It's in the uh, colonial, as they like to talk about it, you know, coastal as it is now, only known as the colonial, I guess. Same way I do X and Twitter, all that stuff. It's too much, too much. With Hampton and a and but all seriously, man, that first game, I got to watch it. It was a barn burner as uh, it was on MLK Day. And, boy, did it live up to the hype in terms of a matchup that went back and forth, uh, big buckets at the end of the game, and then uh, a big shot by a t on the road to get it done to win that game. So might touch on that and get uh, some thoughts on that. But with that being said, welcome to episode 482 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab Radio Show and Podcast, the show that's covering the H- sporting HBC dash for all things HBC Sports. For institutions large and small, from the NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU program and business of HBCU sports. Simply put, we just call it HBCU sports pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As we'll get it done, we're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper. As he gave me a buzz today, he's doing well. Shout out. And I appreciate his uh, support and development. Beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, Charles, how are you doing today? Doing well, Doc. Doing well uh, as we... Uh... Look forward to a lot of action over the weekend, uh, but uh, definitely, uh, unfortunately, we kind of start today on a, on a bit of a somber note. As an uh, uh, individual that we know quite well, affectionately known as Coach Hurst, Coach uh, Dr. Jesse uh, Henry Hurst, Dr. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jesse Henry Hurst, uh, passed away uh, on January 26th, but today he was eulogized uh, uh, here in Houston. Uh, but uh, you talk about an individual – uh, who uh, touched many, many lives uh, in terms of uh, what he was able to accomplish during his 82 years of life uh, among the first African-Americans to play uh, sports at Oklahoma State University. Uh, he coached and taught at Prairie View. Of course, he he, he, he was uh, over at University of Houston. He coached and taught at Texas Southern University, uh, a paragon at Texas Southern University, and uh, a friend, uh, a gentleman who we saw uh, many mornings as we came into the rec center to come work out. Uh, so I definitely wanted to send condolences uh, to his family. Uh, not only that, he's a frat brother by us. So I uh, definitely want to uh, shower his family with condolences uh, in regards to the passing of, of Coach Hurst. It, it's hard to talk about Coach Hurst from this perspective. <laughs> he lived a full life and left a legacy, as you talk about, memories for many people on different levels. When I first got here and I entered into the department at that time uh, was health and kinesiology. We now renamed it health kinesiology and sports studies. Better known for us as HKISS. Um, he was right there, uh, ready and mm-hmm. prepared to help me on my journey. And when you learn that he is a fraternity brother, but he smooth way to check you. And <laughs> it's that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I, I miss it. And you hear about his stories, you know, family member of Oklahoma State actually was, you know, second class to desegregate um, or integrate really more in that term. Oklahoma State football, playing baseball as well, you yeah. didn't realize. Coming out of Jack Key High School, legendary program, was the president of his class there. So he wasn't just an athlete, he was a scholar in terms of what he got done, sociology, earning his doctorate here. Uh, coaching 10 years football and a professor at Prairie View and University. So used to always ask me about going down the homecoming. He would sneak his way down there. Uh, his <laughs> daughter went down there. Uh, his son-in-law is a fraternity brother of ours. 
um, magnificent. They go to the celebration. Bo, every year he asks about that. He would ask religiously as we work out every morning. He makes sure he want to know what my thoughts were on the Tigers, particularly for football. He did it for all the time. But football, he needed to know my thoughts on the matchup. You know, he trusted me that much. He wanted to know my perspective. Were they going to mm-hmm. find a way to get it done? And no matter what I said, if I did give him the right answer, he was going to be a little, look a little bit at me and just like, you're supposed to be helping him get right. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you just asked me what I, how, so he let you know. Uh, but then military, two stints in the wars, uh, reservist, uh, comes back, man, just chalk religiously taking care of itself in terms of what that looks like, what he did with track and field. Uh, yeah. Legendary people were at the uh, funeral this morning in regards to, in so many different facets across right. academically, in terms of the city, sports icons, they were all there, politicians. And so you talk about a measure of the individual, but he didn't let you know that. You know, you could talk to him meeting. And you, until you like get a chance to talk or read a bio, you like, you did all that? Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't show you. So I'm glad that you showed that uh, picture. But yeah, he'd be sorely missed. Uh, he moved on from being a elder into our ancestors. And if you know anything about Dr. Jesse Hurst, better known as coach, he's going to let us know and he's going to be watching out and pointing us in the right direction <laughs> to make sure we doing what we need to do. In one way to hold up the light, represent HBCU in particular, make sure we're taking care of business here at Texas Southern University. With that being said, we'll take a quick moment of silence and then we'll bring you some more updates on the HBCU. With that being said, Charles, great way to open it up to really pay homage. You know, we like do that a part of our show. I'm not sure if you get that many other places, but um, uh, it's a way to share some history in terms of the HBC program, but we stand on the shoulders of giants. So with that no being doubt. said, what's some other news out there that you want to share about what's taking place in the HBC landscape? Yeah, well, let's take a look at uh, the 99th East-West Shrine Bowl uh, will be played uh, uh, tonight. Uh, actually, uh, up there in Dallas, it will be on the NFL Network, but on the field, three HBC football elite seniors, along with a special selection of juniors, will showcase their talents, coached by an impressive lineup of NFL assistant coaches. The game is a critical showcase, of course, for the 2024 NFL draft, offering a glimpse into future professional football. Uh, East coach Richard Hightower on the defensive side for the East will be Mikey Victor, defensive back from Alabama State. On the offensive side, the of West Coast, of course, is Mike Kafka. But Anim Dankwa, a Howard offensive lineman, will be playing for the West, as well as on the defensive side, defensive lineman from Grandma State, Sundiata Anderson. So uh, definitely want to send kudos to those players who are, are moving on from the HBCU ranks and hopefully they can get uh, drafted. They showcase their talents tonight in the East-West Shrine Bowl. No, uh, it's all good. Uh, it's uh, getting these texts coming back and forth. Man, I, I love I love the producer. He keeps me on my toes. With that being said, uh, sharing some good news and some good insight. Uh, with that being said, uh, it's that annual time of the year where everybody gets up and allows it. Sometimes, like I say, maybe rightfully so, where you get the HBC versus H- FBS, uh, what proverbially is called the money games. I don't even know. I want to, I'm going to change the vernacular. I'm going to call it something else. I got to figure out a better way to define what these games are. Um, even though change. essentially I understand what that is. But you got anywhere from Florida A&M at Miami, pay out of 700K, but then you have those that kind of dip down. North Carolina a and at Wake Forest for 20, 325K. Probably the average is right around four. 15 or so when you talk about it. Next highest is Alabama AM and Auburn for 525. Uh, you also have uh, Bethune Cookman at Western Michigan at 325. But you get the druthers, won't give you all of those. Uh, but before I ask you to follow up with your last bit of news that you want to share, uh, any general thoughts in terms of what preferably is called the money game? Well, and uh, actually, uh, 
my, my class, we were talking about this a little bit today. And I think we've okay. talked about this quite often uh, in terms of what we have come to know as these uh, money games. But you talked eloquently and spoke passionately about uh, what is the trade-off with regards to the money versus the brand. Uh, how much damage does it do to the brand of HBC football, to the brand of the institution? Is, is the, but, you know, you, you recognize the revenue aspect, how important that is uh, to the university. So for any of my students tuning in tonight, uh, that is uh, something that we're going to continue to talk about during the course of the semester. So uh, it's a interesting dilemma, ethical, uh, I don't want to say an ethical dilemma, but uh, no doubt a financial dilemma to really pay attention to. Yeah, you might be able to look at it both ways. Yeah, uh, I'm just so. curious in terms of just some general thoughts on your students. I'm sure some of them kind of jumped out of there and gave their perspective. Did they lean one way or the other, or were they just kind of taking it in? Anybody provide a perspective that you were like? Um, I think the biggest thing and the, the scary part for me is the apathy that can happen from playing mm. these games. Uh, does it move the needle that uh, Florida a and is, is playing Miami? Not particularly because they talk about it from the, uh, from the standpoint of being embarrassed by the outcome. So, and that provides a malaise uh, to the students at that institution. So, you know, it's, you know, for some people, uh, you know, at a certain point in life, six and one hand, half a dozen, another, you kind of take a look and you uh, think about the money coming into the athletic department, but, uh, the students, from their vantage point, uh, they're not, you know, doing somersaults about payout games. I think that's important from this perspective. They're they're your current customers in some ways, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but more importantly, they're going to be your next customers and your longest potential customers you have for generations to come. Um, and so if, if there's some concerns there, it kind of gets back to my perspective and maybe I'm weighing too much into that, but I definitely think it's something you have to consider of, you know, what are you doing to a fan base? Uh, Cause you have what you call your denotation connotation as we just think about words, but you also think about this in terms of brand reality, brand association. So if you're going to market yourself that this is going to be a great team and great framework and all they see, generally speaking, all the time pushed out there, Every day of the week, particularly on Saturdays, about these Power Five, now Power Four, some people would say Super Two as the significant brands. And this is already above what you got to deal with the NFL. And you're push, they're pushed in that direction. But you're saying, no, your brand loyalty should be your team. This, this is going to be a good team. But then they'd be like, okay, they get into it. But now they see the score and they're going to naturally question, is this a good team? you don't necessarily take all in the factors that, hey, this brand is paying at this designation and this designation. But most folks, it's just a football team. And so whether you go, you know, or 11 and one, it's to a significant part of the crowd, they're not going to go that deep dive, whether you're playing D2, FCS, FBS, all they look is the total record over mm -hmm. a period of time. And so that's something I'm glad that they are recognizing because it gets back to the research I even did 10 years ago with students. And so it seems like they're saying similar same things, if not even more so now. Sure. With that last thing before we get into this break, Rick Ross, son, Commissioner Bethune Cookman, <laughs> talking about a brand association. Uh, William Roberts III, son of rapper Rick Ross, is headed to Bethune Cookman. The interior offensive lineman has committed to play for Bethune Cookman. Roberts III has played his high School ball at St. Thomas Aquinas, big time program in Florida. Uh, a lot of people recognize out of Fort Lauderdale. He began getting offers back in 2021. At that time, he's getting offers from Miami, Syracuse, Florida, NNS, Texas AM, Colorado, and Albany State, all offering him as a freshman. Uh, the six foot two, 270 pound offensive lives chose the Daytona Beach HBCU over Power Five offers, such as Colorado, Marshall, Florida, International, and Miami. William Roberts the third high school, St. Thomas Aquinas, is known for not only being one of the top schools in the country, uh, but one uh, that produces NFL talent. So it'll be interesting to see what that looks like. Kudos to William Roberts the third and the proud father, I'm sure. Rick Ross says he kind of takes off his hip hop, and now he just gets to be a father. 
and celebrate his son. Kudos to him getting able to do that, particularly mm -hmm. when we get to welcome him into the HBC family. So excited about that. With that being said, let's take our first break. Come back on the other side. We're going to get into some of that basketball talk. Basketball. Stick with us. Be right back after this break. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thins reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, Visit us today to take charge of your learning. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot left. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, Yes Sir. And pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. This is Dr. Will with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Matt Washington is on assignment, but we have a regular. He's back now. We even pulled him into the fold. That's Herbert, you know him, as he's over there on HBCU Nightly. And now Friday, he gives you your basketball dose. We just simply call him the HBCU basketball analyst. As he gets it done, and he's going to take us all around the world. We'll focus a little more on what we call the mid-majors, meaning the SIEC, CIAA. That means we got to show a little love to some NAA programs, especially Langston, that continues to get it done on the men's side. We'll know what you know about that. GCAC has a nice race going on over there as well. Might snick a piece of that. But it wouldn't be Herbert if we wouldn't get him in the follow-up segment when we focus a little more on the men and we do the CIAASIC. But we'll sneak in the matchups for tonight. For the, tonight, I should say, out of the OVC with Tennessee State. They got a big matchup as they take on uh, old conference foe over there, uh, trying to see what that looks like in the OVC with that Moorhead State matchup uh, team currently leading the conference. Then you got a big old, old-fashioned MEAC rivalry that has slid over there into the Coastal Conference. Big matchup where we saw on uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, as that went down to the wire. We might sneak that in in a way. With that being said, let's get into this mid-major, give you the top five. Uh, let's do a little pledging of her and see what he thinks real quick before we get into <laughs> getting some of this stuff. With that being said, nobody dropped out. No news there. Uh, but we have Savannah State Tigers, 13 and 4, 10 and 3, getting some votes, as well as Kentucky State Thoroughbreds, 14 and 5. Not on the list, but a little outside of this fifth Bulldogs out of Tennessee State. We're going to show them a little bit of love, at least give them an announcement, as they are hunting, if you would, to get into receiving votes. As they're 12 and 7, 9 and 2. Top five, though, uh, getting into it. So, so what? Anybody dropping out, receiving votes, jumping in the top five? All five programs still there. Things didn't change. Everybody won. So they just stirred the curse. We do have a difference in a team getting another first place vote and taking it away from somebody. So we'll tell you what that looks like. At number five, Xavier, 
out of Louisiana, the Gold Nuggets. They're 14-4, 11-2 out of the Red River Athletic Conference. are doing well for uh, sitting at the top of the conference. But Texas College sneaking in there and getting some things done uh, and some things to keep your eyes on. But number four, Miles Lady Golden Bears, 16-1, 12-0, undefeated on the season. Miles getting it done uh, as they – through a heart wrench over there at Kentucky State Thoroughbreds the following week, as you know, you saw them take them down. But number three, Virginia State Lady Trojans, 17-2, 8-2. Uh, while Miles is out of the SIEC, as you know, Virginia State out of CIAA, they are in one first place vote with 61 points, but they remain at number three. Bring us to number two, Fayetteville State Lady Broncos, 17-2, 10-1, three first place votes, 75 points. Stick right there at number one, Russ Lady Bearcat. 7 and 3, 17 and 3, 9 and 1 in the conference play. Four first place votes. So you see, they did lose one, and Fayetteville State was the one that gained that vote at 76 points. So it's closing up a little bit on the number one spot, but they hold it down uh, as they continue to do at the top, the Rust Lady Bearcats in week number four. Her, right, take it away. Jump right into it. What are your thoughts? Hey, man, I, <laughs> I think the poll is solid. I mean, uh, I look at in particular, I look Charles, at Virginia. you hear that? You hear that? I heard the poll is solid. I heard the poll is solid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, Making sure you heard it. Go ahead, Herb. Sorry about that. I mean, in particular, I look at the two CIAA teams, um, Virginia yeah. State and Fayetteville State. Um, I mean, what can you say about the performance of those of those women's squads, man? It's a. Uh, I know we've been hearing more about Virginia State's run. Um, in greater circles for the majority of the year on the women's side. But the fact that you got two CIAA, two CIAA squads occupying the same space with the same types of record, um, I love what Rust is doing. Um, I, I know a lot of us have encountered Coach Green. He is a unique guy. <laughs> um, if you've ever watched HBC or listened to HBC Nightly, um, he is occasionally a contributor there. Um, and I've had a chance to see um, those squads play on occasion on HBCU Plus. And they play with a level of intensity that you rarely see in the women, in the women's game at that level. Um, they're really intense defensively. They really get really get up in you defensively. Um, they play passing away lanes extremely well. They're very disruptive. And I really like what that defensive product that's on the floor. And they got some talent that can play at pretty much any level of basketball, any, any level of basketball, whether Division Two, NAIA, or Division One. So mm, good stuff. When 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 you talk about that, those programs favor the state, Virginia State. What's interesting to me when you look at Virginia State, they had won six in a row. Uh, actually, eight of the last nine, they had that loss to Virginia Union rivalry game. You know how yeah. that goes. Fayetteville State is in that mix, and so good information when you talk about focus on it. And, you know, Fayetteville State got it done against Virginia State the first round in terms of 69-78. But the way these teams playing, I'm interested to see in a CIAA tournament, can you get them to class since they're in different divisions? Uh, what are your thoughts to seeing them maybe face off in tournament semifinals championship game? I just hope they're on the opposite ends of the bracket. I, yeah. I really do. <laughs> which, which teams? Which teams? Fayetteville, Fayetteville State and Virginia State. Okay, okay. Virginia okay. State. All right. Um, that CIAA tournament is going to be lights out. You know, I'm just say that now. You know, the conference is deep. You know, there are a lot of really good teams in the conference. Um, and anybody that's been to a CIAA tournament on either the men's or women's side knows that it's a it's a crapshoot when you get there because, you know, it's a completely different game environment, you know, different type of pressure on the line. And, you know, teams step up. You know, it's not, it's not a guarantee to, that the – you know, that the favorite is going to run chalk through the entire tournament. And I'm scared you to get up that way, so I want to catch up with you and give you your thoughts. Let me let Charles jump here and ask a follow-up question uh, as we got you here on the women's side. Well, yeah, Herbert, I'm, I'm going to do this with you during the course of the season because I think this is really interesting. You got a good representation of NAIA teams, SIAC team, uh, two CIAA teams. If we create this Dr. Cabell postseason tournament, which of these teams would, would come out on top in that term? Wow. And we'll do this during the course of the uh, – as we move along, because I'm sure the poll will change 
week to week. But looking at this, is pretty good representation here. Russ to Xavier Miles. You know, who who would be the stronger team and why? If I'm looking at squads this season, um, just off a of body of work, uh, I like the Miles team. I like the Virginia State team. Um, Rust is a wild card to me because, again, the way those guys play defense, the way Coach Green has had his teams play defense at that level, um, it's real eye-opening in terms mm-hmm. of just how disruptive they are against their normal opponents. Virginia State's got a lot of talent, a lot of talent as far, you know, as far as Division II women's basketball goes. I haven't seen a squad in the CIAA that has been that talented um, since the last Shaw team that made the made the Final Four run. Um, they are talented. The Fayetteville State team is talented. Um, that's not to say that anybody else that we were just talking about isn't. It's just when you look at them and you look at that roster and you look at the play, it just jumps out at you on the screen. You know, who are so some, who are some names and faces uh playing uh at the division two level, NAI level that we should keep an eye on that are special when they go out there on the court? That right now, I have to watch more footage to catch up on the names and faces. But I can only tell you as it pertains to the actual total totality of the product on the floor. Um, Virginia State's really up-tempo. Um, they like to get out in transition. They like to get a lot of primary and secondary break opportunities. They shoot the ball extremely well. And I think that has been their calling card the entire year. Um, if you look at their roster, you see the scoring is pretty balanced. Um, and that says a lot about how well of an offensive product they have. They share the ball extremely well. They move the ball in half-court sets pretty well. Although I think they're a little bit more effective in transition than they are in, in half-court, in actual half-court play. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, I mean, I had a chance to catch a little bit of the last couple of games for Virginia State and Fayetteville State over the past couple of weeks. Um, they're like mirror images of each other in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, I think Fayetteville State is a little bit more effective offensively. Uh, they don't necessarily rely on transition as much, um, but they're both extremely good defensive teams. And I think that stands out a lot, um, particularly at D2 ball. I did want to sneak this in for you a little bit before we transition to the men. But I want to take you to the major division. We're going to make this short and sweet, so this may not be fair. Jackson State out of the SWAC. Uh, Norfolk State Spartans out of the MEAC. And North Carolina a and Aggies out of the Coastal. What are your thoughts in terms of those matchups? You can throw in a fourth team, maybe Pine Bluff out of the SWAC jump back into the race, or maybe you want to do Cotton State, at least in terms of what they've done lately, they've been pretty hot. Mm. Uh, so you can kind of pick your fourth one, but four team tournament parlay, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about those four teams in the mix? Who are you saying is coming out of that? Well, we're talking taking, about... Taking a bar from Charles when you talk about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, we're talking about if we uh, strictly from a talent standpoint, I would have to go with Jackson State, followed by Norfolk. Um... Mm. Jackson's mm-hmm. roster, I think the biggest thing with Jackson's roster is, to, is consistency. They've got a lot of really good scores on that roster. You know, Ken Evans Jr. I keep telling Charles. I yeah, keep telling Charles. Evans, you know, the Coleman kid that was tra- that transferred over to Bam- from Bama State. Um, they are deep. The problem with them is that they're very inconsistent defensively. Yeah, Reggie and, Theus and the fam, you tell me different, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, and and look, you know why why you met, it's funny that you mentioned them because I think Bethune Cookman has arguably the best home environment in the SWAC. Mm. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, think they, I think those guys, and you know, to be quite honest with you, those guys are a completely different team with Zion Harmon running point, and he's in the lineup. And I think Jackson State kind of found that out the hard way mm. uh, when he came back. I want to um, ask you that 
I know that was kind of the men's. I want to save a little bit of the men's for the next segment, but from a women's perspective, Jackson State women, um, mm. Norfolk State on the women's side, A and T on the women's side. Sorry, we wasn't clear with that. But from a women's perspective, because on the men's side, we're gonna throw in Tennessee State. We will kind of ask that question again. I would, uh, I would definitely, t- I would toss UAPB in there as well. Um, right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They bring, uh, I mean, we just we're. I mean, I know on my show uh, tomorrow we got a starting five that we normally do in terms of players that stand out. And uh, you know, my colleague Live for Hoops, uh, who's one of our contributors on there, she does start does an awesome job with starting five. Yeah, she is nice. We're gonna have to we have to plug her and bring her on this. Side yeah. So let her know we got, got our eyes on her. doing a thing. But I, but I would definitely say. Um, we're talking about those four. That, that's a look. That's a toss up. <laughs> Ant is, is really, really solid. You've seen those guys hey, playing CAA. We, um, we can dream, can we? Yeah, you know I mean, the NBA, <laughs> we, 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 we can get right. folks to understand about doing a mid season tournament. You know, yeah. yeah. Was, it's, just, it's, two, it's, it's just two games, you know, two days. Yeah. That's all we I need. Love, I mean, me personally, I would love seeing a preseason or postseason tournament like that. Because you, you very rarely get a chance to schedule those lines during the course of a year, um, you know, on either side of right. the right. women. Right. We've been looking for a Norfolk State, Jack State uh, <laughs> matchup for years. Yeah. But we got to get into our break. We'll come back on the side. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it for the men's side, mid-major. We're going to leave that, as we call it, in the business. That's a nice little tease. Well, stick with us. Be right back. And our next break, we'll come back and discuss a little more on the mid-majors. I give you the top five, see what Herb says about that, and give you some love. We'll extend this a little bit because we're going to bring in Langston, see what he thinks about Benedict as uh, that uh, SIC East Division. Woo! That is hot. That's five. But that yeah, being said, good. we'll also tease in <laughs> a little bit of Major, asking him his thoughts on those matchups we discussed earlier today. Uh, with that being said, stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. I'm returning to Clinton, Paris, and Tampa's my community. I grew up here, went to school here, and my wife and I make our home here. What makes Tampa special are its people. So when I represent someone injured in my community, it's personal. Call my office and speak to a real lawyer and not some referral service. I will fight the insurance companies to get the settlement that you deserve. At the law office of Clinton, Paris, we take the pain out of being hurt. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gonna tell you if your team, if they wanna love that and who the ball, ball, ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, uh, cause he gonna teach a lesson. Yes, yes. You had a good show. You know, I'm, that's, this is Dr. Mills inside HBC Sports Lab with Charles Bishop and Herbert Seward. The third, as he's giving us his, his HBC analyst work, we're gonna go into the mid-major on the men's side, give you our top five 
Uh, we had a team that dropped out this week, so we will have a change in the top five. We'll see what that looks like. But let's get into these matchups. Dropping out was none other than Xavier, the Gold Rush, that were dropped to 14 and 4, 10 and 3 in the uh, Red River Athletic Conference over there, but playing some good basketball, still in the mix in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's tough over there. Receiving votes, none other than Winston Salem State Rams, 13 and 6, 7 and 3. Tough loss this past weekend, but they got a big matchup, as you've seen, uh, come out in terms of a hype video. Yeah. <laughs> Wally Pip, and now one of his cohorts that he's working with, the young man over there, apologize, his name escapes me, uh, as he put it out there on Twitter. But in that work they put in that video made me want to fly out to go see what's his Salem State and Livingstone. I don't know anything about it or not. With that being said, Got a new team in the hunt, Texas College still. In the Red River Athletic Conference on the men's side, they kind of edged up and have the victory over Xavier that mm. was formerly in the five. Not enough to jump in the top five, but playing some good basketball. A couple of teams hanging around in the hunt. Xavier go rush. They're still in the hunt. They're outside of that receiving votes a little further down. And Miles Golden Bears, 13-5, had a tough loss as um, they are still hanging on the outside. Let's get into the top five. Uh, you may see something familiar about these five, three of the five teams, if I didn't kind of give it away, that in the top five, what do they have in common? At number five, Morehouse Maroon Tigers, 14 and 7, 11 and 3 is their red hot. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we told you they knocked out Benedict when they were top eight. Well, they're yeah. still winning. They were not ranked. 47 points, while a lot of the focus is on Morehouse for the football and who they were high and whether they're going D1. Some people may want to pay attention to the men's basketball at the D2 level, but they putting in some work. And yeah. that saying at number four, Talladega Tornadoes out of Alabama are 17 and 3 and 8 and 1. Talking about putting in some work. They did have a tough loss. They backed off a little bit. They're still in the hunt over there in the Gold Coast Athletic Conference, but they have some company. Uh, and trying to get into that house over there at GCAC uh, on the men's side. As you have Philander Smith out of Arkansas putting in some work, 15-5, and 11-1. They're outside of that hunt, too. But with that being said, 58 points. They dropped two spots from previous being two. So bring us number three, Clark Atlanta Power, 16-3, 10-3, 71. They move up a spot. You know what I think about Clark Atlanta. I'm just ready to start bidding war. Let's do what we need to do, Clark. I, you know, I've been telling everybody before, it became cool to talk about moving from Division Two to Division One. You know what I'm saying? I, You know, it's just the professor telling you what I know. Now y'all can just say it's the D since I got it right. With that being said, let's go to number two as they move up a spot, the Panthers out of the SIEC. Uh, number two, Benedict Tigers, 17 and 2, 11 and 2, 64 points. Previous rank three, they move up a spot as they get the business right again. As you see, three of the SIC teams are in the top five, but they're all in the Eastern Division fighting for that crown. Should be fascinating, particularly when you get to tournament time. At number one, though, should be no questions about this. Langston Lions, 19 and 0. That close from getting to 20 wins when people are not even snuffing it yet, they're already there. 13 and 0 in conference players, they run rough shot over many of the teams in the Sooner Athletic Conference. Eight first place points. They have them all. 80 points. Number one, the only undefeated program in all HBC sports. One of the only undefeated programs in the country at any mm -hmm. level are the Langston Lions. And they look good at the top of that NIA poll. They representing. With that being said, you see it. I don't know what's the biggest news. Langston at number one that continue to get it done or three other teams out of the SIC, but I want to know what her things. Tell me, what do you think about the top five this week? I think top five is, 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 is right on point. And I'll start off by saying that it's very rare to see any team at, at a, you know, whether uh, you're talking about NAIA, Division Two or Division One, where you've got two – not just all American candidates in the backcourt, but two, you know, uh, national award winners in the backcourt. Uh, Langston has that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the, that backcourt is both nominated for the Bevo Francis Award, which is like the award for the top player in the NAIA. Um, those guys are legit. And I, like I said, I've been saying this all year on my show on uh, HBC Nightly that Langston is a legitimate national championship caliber team um, at the NAIA level. If if we don't see those guys in the Final Four, I'd be really surprised. They mm. are deep. They're deep, you know, from top to bottom. They don't particularly stand out in any particular category, but they're like in top five and, you know, just about every category there is in, in AIA right now. And just the total package of what they have there is, you know, it's, it's incredible because, um, you know, that being said, you know, that it's a shot, it's a big shout out to all the other HBCUs that are at the NAIA, NAIA level, whether you're in the Red River or the GCAC or other places that are putting a lot of work. You know, Talladega's always had an established program. Tugu College is doing well. Uh, Xavier, Louisiana, those guys are a perennial, you know, you know, perennial contender for for March play. Um, there, there's a lot of really good basketball being played at the NAIA, NAIA level, and it's not just links. So it's um it's a really really good thing to see that balance and that type of parity amongst our schools at that level. That being said, the rest of that poll is solid. I mean, the SA, the oh, SA, I see. Chong, 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 Chong. Hold on, hold on. Chong, 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 Chong. We got another solid poll. We got another check mark. <laughs> yeah, I'm just making, I'm just making sure. Go ahead and ask a follow-up question since Herb is getting all these check marks. You know, go ahead and ask. Let me, let me, let me, let me back up. Uh, Benedict. Probably playing some of the best ball uh, uh, out there in the SIAC. We talk about the SIAC East, uh, but what is it about the environment at Morehouse and Clark? How is it that uh, Benedict was uh, went to Atlanta and went O for Atlanta? Uh, that was that 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 turned some heads a couple of weeks ago. Uh, to be quite honest, those are two of the toughest home environments in the conference in mm -hmm. the SIAC. Uh, if you've ever been to a Howard. I mean, not Howard. He's thinking about the MEAC, the MEAC talk. Um, if, you, if you've ever been to a Clark Atlanta game on campus uh, in the AUC, the fans are on top of you in every, at both venues. And when there, whenever there's a big opponent there, that play, those, both places are packed. Mm -hmm. that those are extremely hard places to play. And, you know, to that, you know, to that effect, you know, both of those squads play infinitely better at home than they do most times on the road. Although that, le that leads me to the next question, because just projecting out, I'm looking at Benedict. They got four on the road: Savannah State, Edward Waters, Fort Valley State, and Albany State. Uh, they got a cross rival that went there with Allen, but then Morehouse and Clark come to Benedict, and I was just curious: could we see lightning strike again? Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at that schedule that you just laid out. I think the trap game there isn't one we're talking about. I think that's Edward Waters. Mm -hmm. um, you see, if you've seen that atmosphere at Edward Waters, it's no joke. And that team that they have this year is extremely solid. Clark, you know, almost found out the hard way <laughs> playing down there. They went to a, you know, I think, they, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they went to a, you know, an OT um, in that mm -hmm. game. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, to that effect, I think that's a testament to the depth of the SIAC this year. Um, I know we're talking about the usual suspects, you know, in Clark, Atlanta, Morehouse, Benedict, but the conference this year from top to bottom is tough. Yeah. There's not easy, there, there aren't any easy games. You know, there aren't any cupcake games that you might, you know, traditionally get uh, where there's a delineation between the top and the bottom of the conference. Conference is tough all the way through. And that's even more of a testament to how well the top teams in the upper echelon of the league have played and how, you know, the quality of those teams. Because, you know, I mean, going on the road at Lane or uh, LeMoyne Owen, which is, you know, in itself, a, you know, pretty decent program. Um, Savannah State can knock people off at, a, you know, at a, any given time. Ever Waters is on the come up. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of good basketball being played in that conference. 
And I and, think, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, well, no, I was going to let you finish your thought because I had a, another quick double back follow up question to that. Hmm. Yeah, it's just, a, I mean, this is one of the better years I've seen MIAC, not MIAC, but SIAC basketball. Sure. Um, there's a lot of parity all the way through up and down the conference. And I think that's a really good, that's a really good sign. Go back and uh, you mentioned Langston, how they could be a, a legitimate national uh, championship contender. What are the characteristics, again, about this Langston team that puts them in that potential Final Four? Wow, that's a good question. I think, um, and I know I'm kind of sounding like a broken record here, but it starts with defense. Uh, those guys are at the top of just about every statistical category there is at the NAIA level defensively. Um, on top of that, they've got, you know, I think they're one of the more talented rosters from top to bottom, you know, at the NAIA, NAIA level. Um, uh, I look at the backcourt, I look at Anthony Roy, you know, that dude, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was a Washington State and New Mexico State transfer, um, transferred down to play. And he's been lights out, you know, along with the backcourt. And um, not only that, it's just like I said, you look up and down that roster at Langston, you, you've got legit D1 talent there. Um, that that <laughs> That is not an exaggeration. You know, those – those guys play a brand of ball that's very rarely seen at the NAIA level. And to that effect, you know, I think, you know, this isn't the first time that we've seen this out of, out of a Chris Wright team. Um, Chris Wright, right. again, I don't know. I don't know why nobody's knocked on this guy's door. <laughs> I don't know why nobody, you know, any at division two or division one, HBCU, he could be coaching anywhere he wants. Quite frankly, he, he he needs to get that reset on the cycle because right now, when you go see the basketball hire cycle that was last hired at the mm -hmm. Division One level, it was all about getting those assistant coaches uh, that were at various D one programs. You know, ten years ago they were getting the Division Two coaches, and then fifteen, you know, five years before that, fifteen years ago. You had the cycle where you had to run where folks were getting these really solid NIA coaches that were doing well. So he just needs a cycle, I think, to kind of flip back one of those yeah. things. And it'll happen, particularly if he gets it done. He finds a way to get that championship. I think a little couple of more doors are going to open. To your point, I'd be remiss if we didn't do this before the break. Um, Langston is number two, just for the record, mm -hmm. for those this week in the top 25 of the national NIA polls. And Benedict at the NABC coaches poll, they're ranked just outside of the top 10 at the number 11 to give you some indication of what yeah. Herb is talking about in terms of HBC basketball. But I promised everybody we'd give you a chance to talk a little bit about that matchup tonight, Tennessee State um, and Moorhead State. Moorhead State is at the top of the OBC uh, coming into this matchup at 7-1. and one. They're 16-5 and five overall. Uh, they won three straight games. Uh, but nobody is hotter in the OVC than Tennessee State that has won four uh, of their own trade game, including a win over the number two team, which is Western Illinois, the 6-6-2. Six, six, Tennessee State Tigers are just two games back of Moorhead State. So this is a huge game uh, because of you setting the stage. Tennessee State comes in at 5-3 and three in terms of the conference record. Uh, and 12 and 9 overall. What are your thoughts a little bit about this matchup? And then obviously you have the matchup where we don't have to really get into the records, uh, but you have A&T and Hampton uh, that we're also going to keep your eyes on as that was a classic matchup, as we said, that yeah. went down the buzzer. What do you think your thoughts on the men's side of those two matchups at the major division? Level? Well, I think um, we'll start with Tennessee State. And I, I believe I, I said this again at the very beginning of the year, in preseason, that um, Tennessee State is arguably the most talented basketball team at the Division One level amongst HBCUs. And just looking at what they did in the transfer portal, who they brought in, uh, the transfer and recruiting class that they brought in, um, we're starting to see a lot of that come to fruition um, in conference and the way they're playing. They could always score the ball. Um, they're extremely talented offensively. 
uh, whether you're talking about Christian Brown, who was, you know, you know, stalwart from last year, um, the transfers from Belmont, EJ Bellinger, Michael Shanks coming off the bench. Um, you know, the big transfer from Florida, big guy, uh, Jason Jatobo, who's really kind of solidified how to play, want to play physically in the middle in OVC ball. Um, he's been a difference maker. Um, those guys are explosive. They're they're an explosive team offensively. You don't want to get these guys in transition. If you get these guys in transition and you're not getting back, it's going to be a long night. Mm. And the last couple of the last couple of games um, that we've seen out of them during this run streak, they've converted. They've done a really good job of translating turnovers into transitions transition opportunities. Meaning that they've been extremely disruptive on the defensive end of the court, turn folks over, and they, it turns into automatic points on the other end. So it's um, the fact that they're playing this well at this at this stage of the season bodes well for not only you know tournament time, but their quest for regular season titles. I think that's well within reach. The way they're playing. Good stuff. Before we take our next break. Did want to acknowledge, uh, as you talked about sneaking in there and watching a little bit in the background, Hampton Pirates, North Carolina a and So I don't know if you want to get the second half where you're going to be able to stick with us, but we certainly understand. Uh, we'll talk about that in the break. Uh, but game leaders, as they are tied at half, 25-25. So if this is any indication, this is going down it's like the first. Like the last, it's like the uh, first. Jesuit, uh in first half has six points. He's three or four. Uh, you have Murphy that has seven points and he's three of six. Rebound leaders are dang uh, with six rebounds. That's all defensive rebounds. And Shittipus is six rebounds, uh, four defense and two offensive. Nesbitt, in terms of assists, getting it done as well with two assists. He does have two turnovers. Um, and you have Shell that has three assists, just one turnover. Uh, give you some indicator of what's taking place with that. Let's go into our last break. We'll come back on the other side, give a little more final takes before we get into the break. Uh, for those, make sure uh, you tune in tomorrow for HBC Nightly. It's Herb and his team. Have you heard about all yep. his team getting in there and going to give you all that HBCU talk? With that being said, let's take our last break. We'll come back on the other side. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson.
This is Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Love. Love. And I was just saying love because we got a little love for her because he did us a favor and he stood over to this last segment to get into some of this MEAC swag basketball stuff. As we get into that, one of the MEAC games is the Legacy Classic, which features Hampton and Howard. Obviously, Howard not out of the MEAC, but it's a classic matchup. So you have Thursday, they're going against a and then they got to ship up and go and be ready for the HU battle on the hardwood against Howard. So I think I'm intrigued about that, what that looks like. Uh, and then the other matchup probably is that Delaware State, Norfolk State. Delaware State had two yeah. tough losses, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but they got a chance to be able to make another statement. And it would be a big one because it's on the road. What, what are your thoughts on those two matchups out of the MIA? Oh, man. I think um, I think the – the Hampton Howard matchup is going to be a, a bit more entertaining than people think. Mm. Um, uh, we were talking about uh, some of the stats in the break from Hampton from this past game that's going on with Ant right now. There's a kid on Hampton's roster, Jerry Ding, um, young young cat import. Um, he's got a really really bright future. Dude is a he's a swing man, plays two three, you know, plays the two, plays the three. Um, really, really mature offensive game. I think he's going to have a chance to really um, be showcased this weekend during this game. Um, I look at Howard, and, you know, there's still a lot of talent on that roster. I know the transfers that left with Elijah Hawkins and Steve Self III uh, really changed the makeup of that squad, but um, there's still a lot of really – there's still a lot of offensive firepower on that roster. Um, whether you're talking about Seth Towns, uh, whether you're talking about Marcus mm -hmm. Dudley, um, you know, at the two slot, I think the big thing for those guys is getting consistent point guard play um, from you know from that squad. When they when the point guards are playing well, um, they're extremely hard to deal with. You know, it's when um, point guards aren't playing well that Howard has kind of faltered this year. So. It's going to be really interesting whether to see, you know, which part of that Jekyll and Hyde equation turns up, you know, during that game. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the second matchup goes, man, this weekend, Delaware State Norfolk, that's going to be at Eccles, and that's going to be a tough as nails game. Two really, really tough defensive teams, two really good backcourts. Um, you know, anybody that haven't, hasn't seen Delaware State this year, uh, this isn't the same old Delaware State. <laughs> you know, Coach Waterman has really started to impose his philosophy on the squad defensively. Um, the two guys they got in the backcourt, uh, Javen Mooney, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Mooney's. Javen Mooney's and Martez Robinson, um, to me, they're one of the best tandems in the conference, in the, you know, in, in terms of guards. Um they really make it tough on opponents defensively. I, I can't emphasize that enough. They, you know, those guys have, you know, anytime you see those guys play, they make it hard for you to get, you know, get around them in passing lanes. Um, it's hard to get around them in terms of getting to your spots dribbling. Um, they're really good tandem defensively. Conversely, uh, I think. Oh, you, got, do you want to jump in there and ask a question before we flip well, it to the sweat? Well, yeah. uh, I do want to make this note in terms of your point on Delaware State. Uh, they had that win over Bethune-Cookman and see what they're doing in the SWAC yeah. and that Brock Challenge 72-64. to 64. So while the SWAC had the edge over the MIAC, it wasn't the fault of Delaware State. They got a big win. Go ahead, Charles. Ask you. No, I, I was going to shift gears to the SWAC because I know we're up against the top of the hour, but I'm just curious in terms of what, what matchups in the SWAC uh, uh, should we be paying attention to this weekend? Mm. I'm interested in seeing how Alabama State bounces back um, mm -hmm. after the Texas road trip. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, there. I mean, I think just about every matchup this weekend in the, in the conference is going to have implications um, because of just the nature of what the conference race is right now. Um, like I said earlier, there's a road, there's a, you know, there's a road jam, you know, road, you know, a traffic jam at the top of the conference. Every, you know, you've got three squads that are five and two. Texas Southern is in between that sandwich at four and three. After this week, after this past weekend, um, five and three rather, and then you got another number of squads that are at four and three. So, 
Um, I think there's, I don't think there's one specific game that's going to really, uh, that really stands out because I think all of them are big. I think, you know, <laughs> particularly for this week. Um, I think that's well said. When you talk about the fact you got the Legacy Classic with Jackson State that is coming off two tough losses, uh, Grambling with the loss of both those teams are eager to get the win back and get the win for and Grambling is at the top of the conference tie with Southern Alabama State, so they don't want to let anything go. You got the rivalry match. The Prairie View and Texas Southern is down in Prairie View. Prairie View wants to get it going as they need to find a way to build and stack some wins. The Texas Southern has two straight wins playing pretty solid, and they're just a half a game out of first. And they, they, while they dominated in the tournament with three straight, they haven't got the elusive regular season crown. So I know they're in the hunt and looking at what they can get there. So perfect in terms of how you broke that down in regards to see key matchups. Keep your eyes on the swivel, as they said, in terms mm-hmm. of the swack. And then you have the Florida schools going to Alabama. The Boone yeah. Cookman at Alabama State, Fam you at Alabama AM. Those should, should be fascinating there as well in terms of some of those key matchups. Yeah, give I me think, final thoughts, and then we'll give it a close. Yeah, I think um you just mentioned it. I think uh, you know, um Bethune Cookman and Alabama State stands out to me. Um, as a game on the road, it's going to be. I mean, we already know how tough Bethune has been at home. Um, it's going to be interesting to see whether they can translate that to, you know, another really good home environment at Alabama mm-hmm. State. Um, and I, out of the teams that are in the top um, echelon of the conference in that five and two, you know, jumble at the top, I think Alabama State, if they can get the, you know, the offensive game consistent enough. I think they have an inside track to the title, to the regular season title. Um, just by the way mm-hmm. they play defense, they really, you know, they they have been the most consistent defensive team out of every anybody I've seen in the conference. They do what they do extremely well. You know, they don't turn the ball over a lot with their guards. Uh, C.J. Hines, the Smith kid, um, that rotation is really solid with the Rock in terms of really protecting it. Yeah. And, the question the question becomes is whether or not they can get production on the block with Alabama State because it's you know a lot of, sometimes they get really reliant on the three ball and they can yeah. be really um, with Bethune I mean it's it's the opposite you know they keep the ball extremely well um, one other team though that in swag play that I just I would be remiss if I didn't mention these guys that's UAPB man. Um, those guys, I, I'm just going to put this yeah. disclaimer out for people that um, haven't seen UAPB this year. If you're not running those guys off the three point line, you're doing so at your own peril. Mm. Those guys, they got hot left. Those guys <laughs> are absolutely lethal if you give them opportunities to set and really get get clean looks. Mm. I mean. What they did, what they did the grambling on the road was just ridiculous. It didn't, mm-hmm. you know, you're talking about a squad that was shooting 75% from the three point arc in the first half and finished above 55% for the game. It, As you talk about that, we were sitting on the court side watching the game in terms of Bethune Cookman Alcorn, which is another matchup when you talk about just keep your head on the swivel and the swag. Alcorn has won three straight. Southern obviously is tied for first, and they won two straight. Uh, but what they, um, which is a key matchup, but what Alcorn was able to get done against Bethune Cookman was fascinating. We're watching that game because it's going down the stretch. We're watching Alabama State and Texas Southern live, but we're getting the score updates. And I'm looking at Charles. I say, what is going on in Grambling <laughs> with five ups? So, to your point, you're right. With that yeah, being man. said, we're going to close it down. Great comments for her. Make sure you check him out tomorrow. You see how he gets into it, and he brings in the other basketball heads. And, man, it's some good information to this, too. If you really want to get some good insight on your HBC basketball, the move outside of just the team that you pull for, and kind of look at some key matchups, you can get it right there tomorrow night, HBC Nightly. Herb, what time do y'all start it off? Uh, HBC Hoops Weekly starts off at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So – um, yeah, normally myself, Melvin, who's a, you know who's the founder of HBCU Pass and Live for Hoops, um, you know we're normally the core group. Uh, on occasion, we'll have 
uh, Josh drop in, who's, you know, one of our founders at HBC Nightly, as well as, you know, hopefully we'll be having uh, our, co- our very own Coach Payne, you know, join us on the crew on occasion. Um, I know his schedule has been really, really busy. So, um, but yeah, man, it's, that's why we do it. At, that's why we do it on Friday nights because, you know, HBC was- basketball is worth showcasing and it's worth no uh, being able to, you know, show, you know, highlight these kids and give them a platform to, to really, you know, examine how great of a product HBC basketball is. Awesome. That'll do it. Thank you for mm-hmm. listening to the Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. Well said by Herbert, our HBC basketball analyst. I am Dr. Yana Khalil, the dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We hope you enjoyed it. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. Just finish week four, getting into week five. It should be interesting. We look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Bill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-B-I-L. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-B-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Lecture? Her? Dismissed. Great job.